Okay. All right. We are studying from 1 Samuel, and we are presently in chapter 23. I was trying to finish chapter 23 last week. We're going to finish that chapter tonight, and we're going to move on. And we're going to uh, begin in the midst of, of 1 Samuel 23. David is on the run from King Saul. And keep in mind that this is a this is a, a, a rather lengthy period of time. I don't know the exact period of time, but we're studying chapters that move rather quickly, all right? And so Saul will be at his place brooding over David. David is somewhere in a cave or in some kind of stronghold, thinking about his next move. And there are times when Saul will come after David, and then there are times when he has to take a break and say, I've got to go back home, can't find him, thought I could find him. Somebody will report to King Saul, hey, we think we know where he is, and then David would move. <laughs> now, in chapter 23, David is again being pursued by Saul. But we know this, the Lord has said that he's on David's side. And David's going to be alright. He's God's anointed. What he has to do is just keep trusting in God. Now can we trust in God and yet still have some apprehension over what's happening around us and the future? David did. We're going to, right? That's right. David was having to go through a severe trial and a severe test of faith. He's not giving up his trust in God, but he is getting frustrated. He continually is perplexed by King Saul, just like we would do. And so, um, David, verse 15, it says, Saul, that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was out in the wilderness of Ziph wherever that is, it's all down south of Jerusalem. And he's in a forest, he's hiding, good place to hide. And so when someone, uh, at least during this period of time, was on the run, you might oftentimes hide in the wilderness, right? You would hide in a forest, or you're going to hide in a cave. Whatever he could find, uh oh, that's not mine. <laughs> Whatever he could find to secure himself, that would he do. Now, whenever we're going through a particular trying time, and all of us have gone through particularly trying times, I don't need to ask for a show of hands, right? You live on this earth long enough, you're going to face a trial. As someone has said, either you're, you're coming out of a problem, you're right in the midst of a problem, or hold on, the telephone's about to ring, just like it did, right? <laughs> Hopefully that's not a problem, though. But, uh, you know, something is going to happen. And remember last week I, I gave you the illustration about the, the, the train tracks. <laughs> there are good things happening, bad things happening, and they just sort of go along together. Well, there are times in our lives when what we need more than anybody else, more than anything else, is just somebody. Somebody who can, can come into our world and comfort us. That's what you call a friend. That's what you call a brother. And David had Jonathan, didn't he? So it's time for Jonathan to come on the scene. Jonathan was the Barnabas of the Old Testament, all right? Son of consolation. Paul loved Barnabas, even though at one point there was a dispute between them, and we understand why. And though they were both great men, they decided it would be best if they separated. And because of that separation, they got a lot more done, didn't they? But there was also another man that Paul mentions in his writings, Onesiphorus, who brought a lot of comfort to Paul. And here's what Paul said about him. He off-refreshed me. He's like an oasis 
out in the midst of a desert. Have you ever known people in your life to be like an oasis when you were in your desert? <laughs> That's right. He just said it was you. That's what Marv said. That's right. I believe that. And so there are those who come upon the scene who comfort us. And that's Jonathan to David. And so Jonathan, Saul's son, arose, and he knows where David is. He's out in the woods, down there in the wilderness of Ziph. And I want you to notice verse 16, the latter phrase, and, and just let this be stamped on your mind. I want it on mine. The text says, and he strengthened his hand in God. Or you could put it like this, Jonathan encouraged him in the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? We need people who come into our lives who can encourage us in the Lord. Think about those beautiful psalms written by David, a man who was encouraged by Jonathan. Yeah. He was informed, no doubt, by somebody who knew. That's all I can tell you. Because the same way there were those who were reporting to Saul, there are those who are reporting to Jonathan, there are those out here, you know, who are, who are spying, there are those out here who are witnesses to what's going on, and they communicate that. And so, you know, from time to time, King Saul would get a report, hey, David's been seen. Where is he? Now word has come to Jonathan, hey, we hear, we heard, I saw, and told Jonathan where it was. Jonathan finds David, and the two of them had already covenanted together, and they do so here, and they are going to uh, continue to express their love and appreciation for each other. And I'll tell you something else, Jonathan now knows that Saul, his father, is after David. He knows he wants his life. But Jonathan is, is reassuring him. He says, uh, he says, I want to tell you, my daddy's not going to find you. He says, uh, you're going to be the king over Israel, and when you're the king over Israel, he said, I'll tell you this, I'm going to be there with you. I'll be there with you. So, this strengthens the heart of, of David. Now, as we continue to notice this here, uh, it just it, it just, right after that, these men of the of Ziph, Ziphites as we call them, have uh, they have they have found out about David. They know David's in their area, so they send word to King Saul. All right, that uh, David is is hiding out in the strongholds in the wood. Verse nineteen, and they give him the exact location. Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him the king's head. They must want something, right? Now remember, Saul is the king. He's a politician, isn't he? And so what do politicians do? They go make promises, and others will say, hey, and those uh, who they want to support them, those, those people will say, hey, this, you do this for us, we'll throw our support behind you, right? That's how it all works. And so when people run for, for office, of course they're trying to appeal to one group or to different groups over here, and some over here. And then, uh, hey, these different groups, you know, will say, hey, you know, uh, let's get behind this fellow because we can do well if we get behind this one or we get behind this one. These Ziphites think, hey, if we deliver David into the hand of King Saul then that's going to be to our benefit. And hey, listen, this appeals to Saul. So Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord. Now this still makes, I find this really ironic. Saul has left the Lord, but he still thinks the Lord is on his side. Blessed, blessed be ye of the Lord, for you've had, comp you've had compassion on me. You, you, you have understanding for me. You know that I need to Get rid of this man David, and you're on my side. So now remember, Saul has turned into a mean man. He has turned into an insane man. He's messed up. But he's still got enough sense about him to know, hey, this one's on my side, this one's not on my side. 
And so he is very grateful. So he says, you lead me to the place where he is. And he said, uh, I'll tell you, he said, I am going to, to catch him. Verse 23, I will search him out throughout all the, the thousands of Judah. I'll find him. But you help me out. And so they arose, went to Ziph before Saul, but David and his men, it says, were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain south of Jeshimon. See, he's moving around all the time. He has to do that. Somebody that's on the run doesn't stay in one place, right? You've got to stay on the run because you know you'll be found. That's what David is having to do. Now, it reaches a point where Saul gets very, very close but David is still able to outsmart him. And then word comes to Saul, King Saul, you got to go take care of some Philistines. Philistines are always a problem, right? I have a good idea right now that King Saul would rather get David than he would like to get the Philistines. But this messenger, verse 27, comes to Saul saying, Haste thee and come for the Philistines have invaded the land. So Saul can't let that happen. He has to return from pursuing David, verse 28, and go against the Philistines. And David continues to hide out, and now he's hiding out in a stronghold in Engadai. Now, time passes, all right? What has happened? David uh, finds himself secure for the moment. King Saul is, has, has left him and has gone to fight the Philistines. But then you get to chapter 24, and came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, hey, here's David in the wilderness of Engadai. Now, David no doubt has stayed put for a while in the wilderness of Engadai because he knows that, that King Saul is what? Distracted. And so as long as he's distracted or busy, hey, I'm probably am going to be safe right now. Do you notice how personal this is? Because King Saul is determined that when David dies, it will be by his hand. Alright? It's not like I'm going to send my warriors in and kill, I want him. To the Ziphites, you lead me to him, I'll search him out, and I'll take care of him. Alright? But now something remarkable is about to happen here as we move into chapter 24. I want you to notice that David and Saul are going to come face to face. This thing is about to, to uh, come to a head, as we sometimes say. Now, Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel. That's a big army. And he went to seek David and his men upon what's said here, the rocks of the wild goats. That means a place where men can't travel easily. All right? The goats might can, the wild goats, but not men. He's looking for David because where do you expect David to be found? In a place where few would travel. So he came to the, to, um, uh, to the sheep coats, it says, by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained inside of the cave. That's just a polite way of saying David had to go to, I mean, Saul had to go to the restroom. All right? So... I mean, this, this makes it just really, just, just personal. He gets down to earth right here, where we can understand it. King Saul is out for David. He has to go to the restroom. So he finds a, find, he finds a place where he can go to the restroom. Who's close by? David. And the men of David said unto him, verse 4, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand that thou mayest do to him as it seemed good unto thee, that day has what? It's here. Can't you just hear one of his... Said, David, here's your moment. He must have a big smile on his face when he says it. Guess what? We know where Saul is. We know what he's doing. <laughs> and you can take him easily. He's yours. This is your day. This is what you have, have, been, have, have, have been waiting on. You can go in and you can kill King Saul. That's what they had in mind. 
But very quietly, it seems, that David went into the place where Saul was. And Saul has his back to David. And David, very quietly, cuts off a piece of Saul's garment, his robe, and then runs out. And so Saul uh, came to pass afterward, verse 5, that David's heart smote him because he'd cut off Saul's skirt. Now this shows you the conscience of David. What were the men of David thinking? Go in there and kill him. Cut his head off. Take the throne. David now is like, I can't believe I was that disrespectful to the king. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. What you're seeing here is the one that God said, He's a man after mine own heart. David is saying, I can't believe I was that disrespectful to the Lord's anointed. He says, I should not have done that. Verse 6, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he's the anointed of the Lord. He says, God forbid that, that I should have, should have gone in there and killed him. God forbid that I should go in there and disrespect him in this way. And his men have to be standing there like, we don't understand. We don't understand. This seems like the, the, the logical thing you'd want to do. And so David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against King Saul. He said, yes, he's been delivered into my hand. We can take him right now. But Saul rose up out of the cave. He went on his way. He's taking care of his business. Verse 8, David also rose afterward and went out of the cave. And he cried after Saul, saying, My Lord the King. And when Saul looked behind him, who's there? David. David hasn't gone far away. David's right there. It's David. And not only did David call out for him, when Saul turned around, he bowed before him. Why is he doing this? Because of, because of his, his uh, great respect for Saul? No, his great respect for God, right? This is the Lord's anointed. I don't have the right to take his life. And so David also rose afterward, went out of the cave, he said, My Lord, my King. And Saul looked behind him. And David then says to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt? Who's been telling you this, Saul? My King, who has been telling you that I'm out to get you because I'm not? Now I want you to see here David the peacemaker, okay? This is David finally coming face to face with the one who's trying to kill him. Saul is trying to kill him. And David is trying to reason with him. He says, Behold this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today in mine hand in the cave. I could have killed you today. I could have taken your life. You were delivered into my hand but I didn't do it. And you know why? He says, I'll not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for He's the Lord's anointed. And look what I have here in my hand, David says. I've got a piece of your skirt or garment. I've got a piece of your royal robe. And that right there shows you how close I was to you. I was right there and basically touched you. But I didn't kill you. Now he says, The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. Now an honest man can go to someone who is his adversary, and a man who wants to do what's right and has meant no harm can look another man in the eye and say this, said, The Lord be my judge. I haven't done what you've claimed to do. You ever been accused of something? And you look that person in the eye and you say, The Lord be my judge. I didn't do that. That's a lie. David said, Somebody been telling you that I was trying to kill you? That's a lie. Let the Lord judge between me and thee. If, if indeed I am the one that's wrong and you're right, or you're right, let the Lord judge. 
But David is saying, I know my heart. And he said, I know it's right with God and I didn't do this. And then he quotes a proverb. Wickedness proceedeth from the wicked. Whoever is guilty here, he's wicked. And David says, it was not me. Because I have not desired this. After whom is the king of Israel come out? Listen to what David says here. After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? What's David now saying? Look who I am. I'm nothing. All I ever was was, was a harp player who tried to ease your tension and your pain. All I ever did was go out and win battles for you. That's who I am. And I'll tell you, when you have been guilty of falsely attacking and accusing and trying to destroy somebody else, and you hear something like this, it's going to make you feel about this tall, right? Yeah. Remember, how, remember Saul's mental state right now. Well, that's a big thing when you start talking about craziness because it takes on all kinds of forms. Remember that. Mm -hmm. You can't put this into today's terms because we don't, the way we see things today isn't always the way the biblical idea of things. See, we want to diagnose everything from a medical standpoint today when God might say it's a sin. All right? See, we're living in a world today where we say, well, he's insane. He can't help it. God might say he can't help it. So, you know, did he deliberately do that? I mean, did he, did, was, it, was it God who did it in him? Could God still send a, a spirit that way? You know, uh, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Did he? Or did Pharaoh's old heart get hardened, right? By his own willful decisions to turn against God. You see what I'm saying? Well, when Pharaoh hardened David's heart, when Lord hardened, did the Lord harden it? So, so what we've got here is we've got to make sure that we don't look at this with 21st century glasses and all of a sudden excuse Saul. He's not excused in God's sight, no matter what we think of him. Well, what I'm saying is is that David's heart had already turned against God. Okay, so he's responsible. Saul had. But everything he did does not mean that he was excused because he had a mental illness. Let's just make that, that's all I can say about it. Just because he was after David and he could say, well, I, I, you know, I'm not right in the head. God says, you're responsible. And look at this breakdown all of a sudden. Somebody say something? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Should a person who should a person who went into a place like that be held responsible? Sure. There is something called meanness. There is something that a, a person can 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 uh, you know can be mentally uh, messed up. And he's mean, and we lock that person up, don't we, brother? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are character flaws, aren't they, brother Rufus? Yeah. <laughs> That's what's driving him. Yeah. And we sometimes forget how those things will destroy us mentally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, let's, let's just say for a moment you watch an interview with Charles Manson. And Manson says, I didn't kill anybody. <laughs> well, he must be just inside. Let's just let him out. Uh-huh. <laughs> Want that nut out, right? He said, I didn't kill anybody. Some of their younger don't know who that is, but those of us that are a little older, we know who it is. You don't want him out. A mastermind, right? 
who was behind a lot of people getting killed. But let's get back to our message. We know this. Saul is erratic. His behavior is not normal. But he's not right with God. And let's don't ever forget that. Now, here's what we see is a person who can go from, from one particular error attitude to another attitude. All of a sudden, as he is speaking, as David is speaking to King Saul and saying, how can you do this to me? Saul has a change of heart. Momentarily, doesn't he? Did King Pharaoh have a change of heart? Momentarily? Alright. Now, the Lord judge between thee and me. Verse 16, It came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words of Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? <laughs> and David lifted up his, his voice, or rather Saul lifted up his voice, and wept. Right now he's like, What have I done? Okay, you see, you see the behavior here? <laughs> yeah. You know so much about these people, right? No, I'm just kidding. You know? And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded the evil. Well, yeah, we, we've heard that before, yeah. All of a sudden, in this particular moment, having been met face to face with his crimes, he admits, David, you're a better man than I am. You're a better man than I am. And so... He says, Thou hast shown this day how that Thou hast dealt well with me for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into Thine hand, You didn't kill me. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Or will he let him go away well? No, not typically, right? And so Saul is thinking, you know, I'll tell you something else what's getting to Saul right now is he's thinking, you know, I could be a dead man. Yeah. Yeah, he's thinking right now, I could be a dead man. If David had done what most people... Dead man. Yeah. I mean, what if somebody says, you know, you say, look, I could have done this to you. I know there at your place, there at the place where we work, you know. I know you've been saying things behind my back you have been foolishly and shamelessly trying to destroy me, and now I know something on you. And it can destroy you. And instead of you being in that position you're in, I'll get it. But I'm a Christian. And I don't do people that way. That bring it home? That's what's happening here. And the person say, Thank you. You're a better man than I am. You know, when that person says, I know some things on you, and if I let the company president know about it, you're gone. You're a better man than I. I'm sorry what I have done. And so, in this particular chapter, we find that... Uh, that uh, they're going to go their separate ways for now. Saul even admits, verse 20, And now, behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of, thy, out of my father's house. Now he's begging, isn't he? Saul's begging before David. David swear this unto Saul. Later on we'd find out that David would do something very nice and very kind toward one whose name was Mephibosheth, right? Because a lot of Saul's uh, descendants would indeed be slain. But then we get to that sweet story of Mephibosheth, and we'll get to that at a later time. But here is a, a, it's just a temporary moment. This, this David pleaded his case, made his point, and he got a reprieve. And we don't remove God from this entire picture either. Okay? Uh, God is working all of this out. Now, chapter 25 opens, and there's the death of Samuel. So when Samuel dies, there's a national funeral. <laughs> there's a time of great mourning. Samuel dies. He is greatly 
deme- uh, lamented. Not demented, but lamented. All right? And then we find in verse 1 that David arose and went down to the wilderness of, of Paran. Well, we'll get to that at a later point. I, I want us to think before we close here tonight uh, about something we can all learn. What, what comes to my mind here in, in chapter uh, 20, 24, where we've been studying tonight, is how we learn from David a great character trait, and that is about retaliation and holding one's peace. Um, it would have seemed that David would have been justified, right? That's how worldly wisdom thinks. That David would have been justified in retaliating against Saul and taking his life and taking the throne in that way. But remember that that's not how he was to, to, to take the throne. He's got to do this God's way. And so just think of what might have happened had he retaliated against King Saul instead of showing some patience. Instead of showing some kindness. David would have ended up ruining himself, wouldn't he? That's what would have happened. And so, I think about Romans uh, Romans 12, beginning in verse 18, where Paul talks about, as much as in you is, be at peace with all men. Do all men want peace? Mm Mm-mm. The text says, as much as in you is, what do you do? Be at peace with everybody. Don't ever let there be a disruption of peace, in other words, because of your behavior or my behavior. Don't ever let it be said, you know, well, we had peace (laughs) until you came along, right? Until I came along. As much as in you lies... Be at peace with all men. Now, he also goes along in that same context and says, you remember this. This is the Lord speaking. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Don't you think that that David understood that? And in chapter 24, 1 Samuel, you, you, you see the man after God's own heart right here. I'm not going to take my hand and slay the Lord's anointed. Rather, I will plead with Him, and I will beg Him to to stop this. And so David refuses here to retaliate. And that may be one of the best lessons we learn here. This is not nation going against nation, is it? This is personal. These are, this is a personal offense. It's between the king and between David. Now isn't that what the Lord teaches brethren to do? What we learn in the Bible is that we have three divinely appointed institutions. And that is we have, of course, the home, and we have civil government, and we have the church, a spiritual entity of which remembers. Now, we know from our study of the Bible that governments exist primarily for the protection of their own citizens. Therefore, if there is a foreign power threatening our country, we expect our leaders to do what? More than anything else, protect us, defend us. And of course, we have have, uh, armed forces and... Uh, We have a commander-in-chief, and we have generals and things of that nature. And so more than anything else, that's what we ought to expect out out of the leaders of our countries. Protect us. Keep us safe. All right? And so it's not right to say about leaders in our country, hey, they don't have the right to ever go to war. Well, if we're being attacked, they're called upon by God to protect your people. Now, in the home, for example, If your child back talks you, Jesus didn't say turn the other cheek in the home, did He? (laughs) No, He says you turn that boy around because there's a place on his lower backside and you take care of business. You see? That's, 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 That's different, isn't it? But in the church, what happens? You 
Learn to take in wrongs in order that you might have peace. Now, when we move on in this next count, next week, there's an interesting story about a man and his wife, Nabal and Abigail. We're going to see that while we have, while we have lifted up David in chapter 24, we're going to lift up Abigail in chapter 25. I have a good idea that when we look at David in chapter 25, we're going to say, I can identify with David right there. The beautiful one in chapter 25 is a woman named Abigail. And in that particular uh, narrative, she shows how to handle anger and angry people. All right? So we've learned this week in this particular passage, chapter 24, how to deal with with our enemy, and David did not exact vengeance toward the king. And as a result, he preserved himself the throne. He preserved for himself the throne, when otherwise it had been taken from him, because he would have rebelled against the Lord in killing the Lord's anointed. That's all time ago. Thank you for your comments.